good morning, good afternoon, and of course, good evening, and welcome to 40 something, something like that the edition of the UK Chimwag Pinball podcast. Uh, no Spencer today. I've got somebody with me. Very good player. Very, very good player. In fact, the first player that I ever saw, I think probably the first ever really good player I ever saw, aside from Spencer, of course, who, uh, who got on my Deadpool machine and, and whooped me, basically, at Pinfest. He's somebody that helps run, is a major part of the tournament at Pinfest, a major part of the UK pinball scene. If I can find the, the correct button, which is there, it's Wayne Johns. Hello, Wayne. How are you, mate? Hello, I'm not too bad. Yourself? Hi, I'm very well, thanks, mate. How are you? Yeah, uh, how's good. things going in your pinball world? Not the big news, because we'll hold that for now. What are you playing? What are you yeah. up to? Um, well, currently, I've only got Godzilla and I've borrowed the Beatles. And with the new code coming out on Godzilla, it's just Godzilla over and over and over, really. Has it changed minute. it much? Um, there's a couple of wizard modes in there now and a few other little tweaks and thing so it, it's got to be the greatest game ever oh, i'm saying i'm saying it now there you go okay well that was that was going to be my my question so obviously i know you've had jurassic park there i know you've had avengers infinity quest i know you've had iron maiden it's so clearly the best of the elwin games and the best of all time yeah well keith elwin's costing me a fortune i hadn't ordered i'd never had a new inbox until iron maiden and then after that it was well i've got to get jurassic park and that was a step up, so it was where I've got to get Infinity Quest. Infinity Quest, I think, was a step down. Um, it was still a great game, but not up to a standard. But Godzilla's just a level above everything else. You've only got to look at the number of people that you know have bought one or got one on order. Because the back order's going for months and months and months. So we can't all be wrong, can we? I would hope not. I would hope not. So, what what is it? Let's let's get a couple of specifics. What what makes this game stand out from the rest, or even just stand out from the rest of the Owen games? What is it? I think it's the fact that it offers different things to different people. Um, I like a game like Iron Maiden or Jurassic Park where it's really deep, and you've got to be a good player to get near the end of it, and it keeps you coming back. But there's also lots of achievements that you can get early doors. Um, how do they phrase it? Close to the start button, you can you can get something cool. Um, the building going up and down on the premium, the mech gods. I'm I'm looking over to the side because that's where my machine is. I'm just taking reference from it. Um, the pop bumper right down above the slingshot. They're all things that are slightly different, but just the the general flow of the machine. You shoot the shots and it puts the ball on another flipper. Almost every shot can send it to another flipper. So it it's great. It really is. I can't wait. I cannot <laughs> wait. Honestly, I really I really can't. Um you've posted a thread recently. I uh, say recently, we're we're gonna we're archiving this particular chinwag. If you're if you're watching this in in a couple of weeks or whatever, and you're thinking, oh, hold on a second, it's not recently. Um it might it might have quite a few views by then. Rights of pinball passage now i'm not going to go through the whole list because we've got other things to discuss um you've started this thread and it's on it's on pinball info and i'll put the link in the description below i made you start you just thought of an idea for a thread you thought i'll keep going i'll keep going um i want to pick you up on a couple of them though and you're gonna need to explain yourself um a pinball machine would woodworm in it yeah well before we before we look at the specifics as you say what it was, there was someone posted a thread on Pinball Info that he had an Olympic hockey pinball machine. Um, that he wanted to know if anyone wanted it and how to get rid. And remarkably, he said he was giving it away. He wasn't selling it. So I thought, I'll send him a message because he's only half an hour away from me. Um, and basically said, look, I'm sure you're going to be inundated with hundreds of people after it. Um, I'd like to take it because I've been in the community so long, there's lots of people I know who, if I couldn't bring it up to standard, would be able to assist. Um, it's not going to be stuck on eBay. 
um, and I'll take it to the shows. And it transpired that he'd had the machine in his mother's house for 25, in his mother's garage for 25 years. Um, after he'd had it for three or four years prior to that. Basically, when he got married, his wife said, that's not coming in the house, which is why it ended up in his mother's garage. Unfortunately, his mother passed away recently and it needed to strip the house. And rather than just scrapping and binning it, he put it on the forum and I picked it up. So, oh, so I went you've got pick... it. You've got it. Yeah. So I picked that up on Saturday. Um, lovely bloke. The guy's name is Russell. Um, took it round to Terry's. And while we sort of like got up on legs and were playing around, seeing what was what, Phil Dixon came round. And it was him who put the idea in our heads. He said, oh, that's you. Another step on the rites of passage that you've got a free machine and it's a garage find or a barn find. Yeah. Um, so then we started thinking. And it, it's little things like how many times has anyone taken the glass off, cleaned the machine, put it all back together, press start, and it's made the pinball missing sound. So we literally just started going through them. And I know that certain people have picked up old DMs. They've got it back, and it's literally been riddled with woodworm. So before they can do anything, they've got to strip it down and and treat it for that. So it just kind of expanded from there. I started thinking of all of the the newbie mistakes that you make. I mean, I've gone to a show, set a machine up, and then driven home with the keys. <laughs> While the show's been going on over the weekend, I was going to collect it at the end. Um, and it, it was just a little bit of fun. I also stuck it on that other American one inside and it, it, then some of the ones on there are quite amusing what people have added to and there's a couple of um specific ones getting lost in a van getting lost with a van full of machines was paul garner i believe sure Lit literally got lost and nearly drove the van into a ditch trying to do a three-point turn down a little one-way road um dropping a tray of drinks at a pinball show, obviously everyone knows Poybug did it at the last pin fest, but Vin also did it at Swavesy a few years back when England were playing. He literally knocked over a whole table, which was rammed full of drinks oh, when England no. scored. Oh, no. Um, and he was, I don't care, England have scored, that'll do. <laughs> Yes, it's just everybody. It's, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you think drinks, it was drinks just are a <laughs> Everybody else is thinking, well, we bloody, we bloody care. There's 200 pounds worth of drinks there. Um, yeah. as long as so that's where it came about. It was a little bit of fun. I like it. I like it. Um, yeah, a few of them really resonate. Well, I think lots of them resonate with lots of people. Um, I'm particularly the moving it without the, the back box secured. Not everyone's yeah. done the thing without putting uh, the pinballs in there. Uh, I, the play field falling on your head. It's been close, and I'm tempting fate. Uh, that's happened to you, is it? That's got to hurt. It hasn't happened to me, but I've had to come down and someone's caught it. But I believe, sure. again, Poybug is working on a machine at home. The play field's fallen down and literally trapped him inside the machine. Oh. And he's had to, I can't remember if they had to shout for his son or waited for his son got in to free him <laughs> because he literally couldn't move. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a look. If you haven't had a look, take take a look. There's just so much stuff. That certainly, look, again, you, you haven't really moved the machine around if you haven't lost the ratchet strap. There's just so much stuff on here. Uh, really, really good fun. Um, right, Wade, you've, um, actually, before we get on to the... Uh, the main crux of this. Can I just get you? Uh, I want to talk about Pinfest later on once you've discussed your stuff because I think you do put on a, a hell of a show there and um, the tournament. Um, that, that well, I know yourself and Paul work so hard at it there. Um, but because I think you spend a lot of time playing, and we discussed this last time, it can't be easy to play, or for anybody that puts on a show, and be really, really competitive in that, because you've got so many distractions as well. Um, but I know you went to Neil's recently, and you, you played really, really well there. I just wanted to 
yeah, just get a little bit of a little bit of feedback from you on that, really. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's obviously because I do the league, and the way the league works is at someone's house, so it's their machines. So they should they should win every time if they're a half decent player. They know how their machines work. They're a massive advantage, you'd think. Sure. But I actually looked through previous Midlands meetings. And the hosts weren't winning, even though they were decent players. Um, and it's because you've got someone coming along and going, oh, the ball's stuck on this, or where's the toilet? Or, so you, you can never fully focus on, on the game. Um, I've stepped down for next year as the regional coordinator. Um, so I, I might get to be Nick. <laughs> But what it is, it's the fact that it at times it almost feels like a job. Yeah. Um, you've got to be there. You can't disappear. You can't miss a go. Um, and it's the same with one-off tournaments. Now, as you kindly said at the start, I'm a decent player. Oh. I'm not the I'm not the best player. Otherwise, I'd be ranked number one. Um, but just occasionally. It just everything comes comes together, and it it did that weekend, with the exception of the final. Um, I was going to say I think I'm being modest. I won the first two competitions on the Saturday. Um, got to the final on the Sunday, and it was on Infinity Quest, and I'd only played Infinity Quest three times at Neil's. And I was grand champion high school one and high school two. So when, so when it was picked, I was here we go. I know the machine. I know the way it's playing, and I scored ten million and finished fourth. Oh. Um, it it seems churlish to be disappointed with the first, first, and fourth, but I was gutted because yeah. I thought I could have taken a clean clean sweep. But sometimes, just you know yourself, there's a difference between having a great game where you put three good balls together and having a good tournament when you're able to put 15 good games together. And that's what the top players can do. They're consistently good. I'm good in spurts, but I tend to have two or three games which let me down completely. But yeah. It's, it's tough. It's a. It is. It's tough. It's, there's no doubt. There's no doubt about it. It's uh, one day. Well, I say brilliant. You know, with in in relation to how good you are, your own ability. So I, I can be the top of my own ability on one day, and then absolutely crap the next. You know, I, I can't. Yeah. It's it's amazing, and you know, it's like your radar's out and everything. You, you I don't know. Your reactions are slow, and this, that, and the other, and then it's it's crazy. And uh, the, funny enough. Today, um, I had to be somewhere at two o'clock, and it was literally right across the road. So twenty to twenty to two. But I'll have a I'll have a game of Monster. Man. I'll have a couple see, of games. See, see, that's another rookie mistake. I should have put that in the rights of passage. Start a game when you've got to be somewhere at a time limit. Yeah, because it's guaranteed that game will be the game of your life. I've got so I've got um, Bride of Frankenstein. Not only got I got the instrument. It's all done. I've got Creature, Monster Bash is done. Hold on a second. I've, I've only, which I find the easiest one is the um, the werewolf, the wolf man. Yeah. I find that the easiest one on there. All I've got to do is get him and do the, inst- you know, and, and get the instruments on because I didn't get the instruments on the first time round. I'm, I'm into, I'm into whatever it is. Monsters are Monsters rock. Monsters are rock. Oh, my. But it's one, it's one fifty-seven by this point. Ah, and, <laughs> and and I'm, this is on two balls. It's on two balls. Uh, but I had to go. I had to go. And I thought, do I leave it on? Do I leave the machine on? Which so you must. Everyone must have felt. But I just not in a position. There's a bit of work going on. I thought I just can't. I can't do it. So yeah. Um, well, the thing is, even if you had left it on, you'd have come back and you'd go right here. We go. And you wouldn't have touched the ball, house ball, oh, straight down the middle. <laughs> yeah, absolute crap. They, exactly, exactly how it went. So there we go. Um, yeah. Right. Let's have a little chat about your. Um, well, you you tell us how are things changing for you in the pinball world? You have got some quite exciting news. Yeah. Well, I thought it was. I'm maybe starting to regret it. 
Um, just to speak about the IFPA, is International Fed, oh, I don't know, International Federation Pinball Association, That'll something. I probably, right. should have, I probably should have researched that with what I'm going to say next. Um, but they're the people who the tournament directors send the results through um, and give you your ranking and work out how many points each of the competitions are worth. Um, organize the world championships, the state championships in America, and the European championship, championship series, and also the UK series. So they've been going 15, 16 years. Um, and as well as the guys in America who basically run it, each country has their own representative. I think the official title is country director. Yeah. Um, and since its inception, it was Martin Ayub yes. who's done it. Now, I don't know how many of the, I'm going to call you a noob as well, how many of the newer people know Martin, but Martin was the UK number one for as long as anyone can remember, basically. Um, really top quality player, travelled all over America, Europe, and he was a country director. And five, six years ago, give or take, he he almost quit overnight from entering the competitions. He said it, he's not enjoying it as much. So why put yourself under that kind of stress and rather play for play for fun? Yeah. Um, he continued his role as country director. And then about two, two, three weeks ago, literally just after the last league meet of the Midlands, um, he sent me a message, said he was stepping down and asked if I would like to take over. Um, it's, a, it's clearly, it's an unelected post. Um, it's by mutual agreement of the, the current CD and IFPA. Um, and Martin felt that I was probably best placed to carry it forward. Did you have to so wear the, a brown envelope? No, no. If I'd known what I know now, it probably would have been a brown envelope going the opposite direction. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so the way I see it, there's two, maybe two or three roles of it. It's speaking to all the other country directors in the IFPA, we've got our own forum and threads that we chat about. And hopefully um, a WhatsApp group. No, we're not quite that technical yet. <laughs> not, not giving anyone my number <laughs> out. Um, and that's basically to look at and come to a consensus of what rule changes need to be made, what little tweaks, so that it fits in with how the IFPA think a tournament should be ranked. Um, then there's things like where's the world championship going to be held where's the europeans going to be held and then it's also to offer each individual country give support rather than phoning josh up or emailing josh who's the president um at three o'clock in the morning saying i'm not allowed in this tournament how am i going to so the the idea is to come to me i sorted from a uk side i can then I can go back to America for clarification, just to say, look, are you happy with what my ruling is, basically? Um, and it's generally in the background. I think four, might be four or five years ago, everything the IFBA has ever done previously has been completely free. Um, they sort through all of the tournament results have come in. They do the ranking, do all the server, produce all of the trophies for all of the major tournaments. And from there on in, any additional money that comes through from sponsorship, they donate to charitable causes. Okay. Um, obviously, mainly in America, because that's where the sponsorship's coming from. We've got the Stern tournaments and the sponsored by... Oh, it does the light. The, oh, come No, the light blades that I've done. Oh, the pin. Pin, pin. stadium, that's pin. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 
yeah, the, the proper ones, not the cheap knockoffs. Um, <laughs> so they're on they're on the website as well. So they're obviously getting a little bit of income from that, which goes towards server and whatever, and then the rest goes to charity. Five years ago, they introduced a fee in America only, which was every person in a tournament at the time the tournament submitted one dollar gets paid to the ifpa so if you've got a tournament with 16 people regardless of who they are 16 dollars gets submitted at the time of entry otherwise it's not that tournament won't be worth ranking points they won't it's, put it onto their database it's not ratified basically yeah um and there was uproar it was oh well there's going to be significantly less tournaments i'm not giving you a dollar um it's for charity every argument you can think of and to be honest even though it was only affecting the us i was front of the queue because i didn't see the need for it roll on five years later and with the exception of covid when everything shut down the tournaments and the people entering tournaments has increased significantly um in the us i mean massively josh did send me the figures and i haven't got them to hand but it's something like 30 to 40 percent increase every year on the number of people and that's because with that money they split it basically 10 percent goes on admin fees and the basically the transfer of the money the rest of it was pretty much going towards the state championships. So every dollar that was paid in Minnesota went into the Minnesota final prize pot. So it meant that there was significant values of money up for grabs. And it then increased more people going and entering. And it sort of, more machines started going into pubs and it was basically, it, it's really taken off. Okay. So, as from the start of next year, that is being introduced worldwide. Which basically means that every tournament in the UK, to submit a tournament with 30 players in, the tournament director will pay £30 at the time they submit to the IFPA if they want the world ranking points, the whoppers, so they can move up the ranking. Now, this was a done deal before I joined. So it, it's happening. Um, the things to consider, because I know there's going to be, it may not even be a minority, but a lot of people who will, oh, it's ridiculous, you shouldn't be doing this, and blah, blah, blah. Before I, I was afraid, yeah, before I knew this was happening, I put a post on Pinball Info asking who enters the tournament purely for the ranking points. I remember. And I think it was three people said they entered, entered for the ranking points. There was another dozen or so who said, yeah, it's a nice little bonus. And then 40 or 50 who said, not interested in the slightest. So out of that, so that's only about 7 or 8% of people who care about it, if they've been completely honest at the initial, at the initial poll. <laughs> and so we... we I, we, I we, suspect we, not. I suspect I sus not. I suspect there may be a little um, change of opinion. Mm. But the two things that, that the IFPA have pushed, and when you think about it, are true, you can have a, a fun tournament without ranking points. Matt Vince did the interclub up at Electric Circus, Wonderful. not a ranking point in sight, and it was such a cracking day. Yeah. So if you want to hold a tournament, go ahead and do it nothing stopping you a lot of people say they're not interested in the point so it's not going to affect them at all there's different ways about taking getting the pounds to america really isn't there 
because as a rule, we then generally don't have prize money in the majority of tournaments. Or if it is, it might be 30, 40 quid if you're lucky. So you could put a pound extra onto the entry fee. I don't think many people would begrudge that. Or you could take a pound off the price pot. Or if you're going to be really flash, you could go out and get sponsorship. If you still wanted your tournament to be worth ranking points. Or you could just crack on, put the pound straight to the IFPA, and there it goes. But do we do we get it in this country? The, the pot once they've taken the ten percent, right? So this this was going to this bit is still open to discussion, and this is why I might be the shortest length country director in the history. Um, my personal opinion, yeah. So that ninety percent, which we keep, which we've generated in the UK, yeah. We all of the country directors were asked, How would you like to spend that money? They didn't go for country director travel expenses or the country director to get a brand new machine so he can practice. Ah, they, weren't, terrible. they weren't going with that. Terrible. Um, oh, one thing I should say before we get into that the year before COVID, it would have been £1,850 coming to the UK. Okay, we, we're, not, we're not talking tens. Tens of thousands. It's not large amounts of money. No, but it, it would it would put about um, it's about a grand left over if post COVID it matches pre COVID once ten percent has been taken. Yeah, the, looking at about the, a grand. The figures are looking at being on the increase. I think we're going to have more in twenty twenty two than we yeah. did pre COVID. Sure, and it's not going to take any effect until twenty twenty three. So at the end of twenty twenty three. That's when the money will be dished out. So all of the country directors were asked how we would like our, our, the money generated in our country to be spent. And there were stipulations. You could spend some money to give to charity, some to give towards travel expenses for the top two ranked players to go to the world championships. Yeah. Um, money towards the setting up of the European championships. So literally each country would put money into the pot and whoever, whichever country was hosting it would get that money um, and it would go around in a circuit. So my personal opinion was the money shouldn't leave the country. It's UK payers paying for it. Therefore, we should yeah. benefit the UK players. Um, I had a little bit of a private chat with seven or eight people, literally everyone who's run who's run multiple tournaments in the UK. And that was the general consensus, that it stays in the country. Um, and I think I broke it down as 30% went to charity. But that charity will be chosen by whoever won the UK championships. That's so it's not just a random yeah. pick a charity. Um, because we've all got our favourites and yeah, for sure, ones we want to do. So, whoever wins, that's a little bonus to them. They can put it to there. Um, there was a nominal, I think it was just ten percent towards travel expenses. So that would work out that last year it would be Andy and Craig that get fifty quid each. Now that's not enough to get you to America in a hotel. It's it's almost a first prize for finishing first and second. Um, and then the other was set up for the UK Championship Series. So the final, the money would go to whoever was hosting it. And that could be spent on prize money, trophies, um, little things like rebuilding the flippers to make sure the machines in use are all in A1 condition. So I submitted that and I was pleased with myself. There you go, my first contribution. Been diplomatic and dis discussed it with other people. Um, and it's since been suggested by a couple of countries that it would be worth clubbing together and every country saying we're going to give 10% of our takings, put it into 
the European Championship finals, um, and then the IFPA would make up the rest of the money for first prize to be a new inbox machine. The thinking being it will attract more players and raise the profile and a bit of prestige. My personal opinion is it's only likely to benefit a small handful You're right. of the community. Yeah. And it's open, as I say, it's currently open to discussion and debate. Um, and we'll see where that goes. But and I'm, I'm, I'm certainly pushing for it to stay in the UK and to let us decide how best it's spent. But we shall see. Well, it's, it's an old football argument in that sense, isn't it? Gra Look, what you do, nurture the grassroots of the game, or I'll give it all to um, at the Premier League, so to speak. So uh, I, I sort of get it. I think you've done, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer, Wayne. That's the first I've heard of it. And I think you've tried to divvy it up as best yeah. as best you can, you know. Really. I think if it, had, if it had been tens of thousands of pounds that we're talking about, it's not a decision I'd be making on my own. Um, it would definitely be some kind of committee or vote or something. Sure. But yes, it's 1,800 quid. It's it's not massive amounts. You try picking up a pinball machine for 1,800 quid. Well, <laughs> See where this that is, it. when you were talking about the pound, this, that, that's the first thing I thought when I, I thought, you know, people are probably not going to argue too much about paying a pound because... Well, number one, the pinball machines cost so much money anyway. We're all happy to to go into an arcade and put a pound in a pinball. It's yeah. it's not it's a pound's not, one game, exactly. Pretty much, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. Compared, just bear in mind what the hobby is. Um, I don't yeah. expect it. I've got a couple of questions for you, which um, which are just just things that sprang to my mind. If I'm thinking it'll be people, I'd, I'm sure there'll be yeah. one or two other ignorant people like myself who don't know. Okay, <laughs> so um, the IFPA uh, and then deciding on the ranking status of a tournament, right? Okay. So basically how many ranking points you'd get for winning a tournament. So if I had a tournament in here, you wouldn't get many ranking points. The top ranking tournament, I guess, would be whatever the UK Open, right? Right. This is <laughs> another... <laughs> yeah. This is another bone of contention where I don't necessarily toe the party line, as it were. Or I didn't. I'm, I'm already I'm coming around to it. Yeah, yeah, you're you're a right. raucous, a, what, ra what? a raucous, unsavory <laughs> character. They they're regretting her pointing you down. Oh, I'm certain that's the case. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't remember what version because the ranking points change every year. But it used to be every tournament was worth twenty five points, regardless. Um, other than the World Championships and Pinberg, which were worth double. And then more points are added, or more value is added to the tournament for the number of people that entered okay. and the current ranking of the players that have entered, or current rating, okay. to be precise. But it just became an arm race because, I mean... A, I'm sure it's well known. Modern Pinball, which is now closed down, unfortunately, in New York, they used to run a league on the top 20. They had 25 machines in their arcade. And the top players or the top high score on every machine. Now, every score on every machine that was played over that week got ranked like a league meet. But what they were doing was every single person that walked in off the street and played a game, they were entered into the competition, even if they only Aww. played one game. So they played one game. The locals would play all 25 games. They'd be guaranteed the top places. The tourist, if you like, who didn't even know they were in a competition. Sure was still being entered. So that bulked out the number of numbers. And they'd have three, four hundred people entering. 
so, over yeah. the course of the week. It's, and a bit like, worth... it's a bit like a chief coffee, but all the people going in for a coffee and a cinnamon twirl don't realise that they're, they're in a tournament. And then basically someone saying, hey, I've, I've won because 300 people walked in for a coffee. Yeah, that's effectively what it is. So what they did to stop that was, right, OK, you're not included in the tournament until you've played five tournaments. And they thought, yeah, OK, we fixed this. Five weeks later, <laughs> they're back in the same situation. I'm sure they were. Oh, my word. Um, so, they, so then they decided that he needed head-to-head -head play. So you could qualify from a league position, but there had to be a playoff. So that stopped leagues for other reasons as well. They also said that half of the people had to have played half of the games. So if you only played one out of 25, it doesn't. And it was getting so complicated sure. that no one really knows what it's worth. If what, so then they came out with the TGP. Um, I know it is total games played, but that's not what it stands for. Basically... Every game played gives you 4% towards a tournament. So if you play a tournament where the average number of games played is 25, it's going to be worth 100%. The thinking behind that being that the, the formats that were in existence at the time, not every tournament would reach 100%. But it then became an arms race. So they go, right, okay. We need to play 25 games in as short a time as possible. I know, we'll invent Flip Frenzy. Which is basically, we've, I was the first person to bring it over here. Basically, you've got 12 machines. Yeah. And then you have 30 players. 24 people are playing at once with six people waiting in the queue. The first person that loses a game steps away from the machine and the first person in the queue then joins that machine. And then when the, ne when the next player loses on that machine, they step away from it and someone else joins. So you've got every machine in constant play. And you can play your 25 games in three and a half hours, four hours. Sure. So you could go, right, okay, we're going to hold four flip frenzies and you can get it all finished in a day yeah so it's a constant little arms race sure the thing so new rules come out and these are currently still in discussion again with little what little tweaks and it's in the public domain it's on tilt forums it's a matter of you can now get up as high, I think, as 225%, which from a mathematician's point of view isn't very elegant, but it was decided that that would be... That was As a percentage, <laughs> that's a weird one. Yeah. <laughs> it was decided that would cause less friction than having the new maximum as 100 and the current maximum being nerfed down to 60%. Or thirty-five percent, people would go. Oh well, you're ruining the rankings. And the idea being that to to get the top value out of a tournament, you've actually got to put on a significant tournament. There should still be the same amount of fun if you hold. How many games have you got of yours now? Five. Five. You could host a tournament for 12, 18 people with those five machines, and it would still be a good laugh. It would yep. be a good day. Everyone would have fun. But that shouldn't be worth the same amount as something like Neil's putting on. Sure. We're qualifying over two days. and So that's the thinking behind it. Yes, still running tournaments. We just need to be realistic that but you, I could still they're get not of the same calibre. 
yeah. for a, a tournament this size with 18. What's the minimum number of people for a tournament? Two. It's not much. It's not much of a tournament. <laughs> it's not much of a tournament. No. <laughs> no. The, the the considerations for a tournament is either it needs to be in a public venue, open to anyone. Yeah. Well, any tournament must allow anybody to enter, unless. But, you, but a, you can have a finite limit. So I would open it, a say there's eighteen green. people. Yeah. First come, first serve. Yeah, and that's the way it's got to run. It's got okay. to be first come, first served. I mean, Greg hosts the Robot Bash. Yeah. Um, Dorset Way. And he's Wallach, done yeah. he's done that New Year's Eve for however many years, or the 30th. But he, he can't accept 70, 80 people. No. So it's literally it's the first 30 or 32 or however many he's decided on that enter are in there. You can't stick your missus, your kids, your neighbours, stick all of them in and then open it and go, oh, it's full. Yeah. Um, you're allowed to host in a private venue and not publish the address because you don't necessarily want to put on a public forum. Here you go. I've got 30 Ellie Stearns here. This is my address. Oh, by the way, I'm going on holiday in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what you're allowed to do, you're allowed to keep that address hidden. You've still got to submit it on the IFPA, but they don't publish it. And you're allowed to host five of them a year, I believe. Um, you can't just do it every week and just keep keep going. So there's, there's no real limit. I mean, I said two people. Yes, it's tall. I mean, you wouldn't really bother entering that. But any number of people you can have a have a tournament for and it can be eligible for your ranking because I've seen it myself. A lot of other people have gone through the same experience and I know that Josh has mentioned it himself. The people who are most excited about the ranking points are generally the lower ranked people because if you win, well, if you come eighth in a tournament at Neil's, for example, that might be worth one and a half points. Just a random figure. That might move you up from five thousandth up to three and a half thousand. Sure. So you see yourself climbing up. Then as you've played more and more tournaments, because your top twenty best tournaments count, you end up finding your level basically and then you don't move as much so then you're only really comparing yourself to the people around you whether that's in the uk or the country or your mates who are close to you the people right at the top of the tree i'm guessing don't really care and i've been told oh they don't care about what rank they are i think that's a bit like my poll I think they do care. If you're if you're in second place and you're one tournament win below first place, you're going to be interested. And likewise, if you're one position off qualifying for the world finals, you're going to be interested in following those. So it's only at the very, very top and the the mid to lower where people really care about the ranking points. And there's people at the top and there's people at the bottom who don't care. But I think it's a fun thing and it's it's not ideal. Um, I think there's people ranked higher than their ability and I think there's people also ranked lower than their ability. Um, you can be the judge of I'll who definitely, those, I'll definitely rate who those people ability, are. Wayne, I've got to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely un underrated. It's funny what you say about the competitive thing. I know competitive people. I, I really do. And and it, I, I find it hilarious to think that somebody that's competitive enough to go to a tournament, be competitive in the tournament, care about it enough to practice, to learn the rules, be that invested in it, it's going to be blase. I, mean, I don't care about that. Right? Because honestly, <laughs> I know competitive people. You can't, you can't play Monopoly with a competitive person. You can't play no. golf. With, you, you can't even walk down the pavement, with, you know, because it's just got to be, you know, um, they'll, they'll turn a trolley, push a trolley around a supermarket into a race. Competitive people yeah. will. I, I know plenty of them. So, yeah. We're well, saying that you can, you can have the competitiveness, competitiveness, and that edge to a competition, 
without the ranking points. The ICC is a perfect example. There was no ranking points, but we were all going for it. And likewise, the classic meets and the high school, the stern launch parties at Electric Circus, I think I've won three or four of them. And it's worth 0.6 points. But I still played as hard as if it was worth 50 points. Sure. There wasn't even a trophy. <laughs> I think um, I got a fiver. It cost me a fiver in petrol to get over there. <laughs> oh, no. This is, this is it. And we all do it because we're competitive when we're on our own. We're competitive against the machine. Yeah. Because you come back from your appointment at 2 o'clock, you come back and you're having a crap game and you're shouting at the machine but, um, because of how crap you are. Like, What's gone wrong? I mean, um, I always say, if it wasn't meant to be a competition, they wouldn't need to bother with a score. No. You just flip the ball around and they go, oh, yeah, that was fun. No. There's, no, there's got absolutely. to be some kind of competition. Even if it's only, as you say, even if it's only against yourself trying to better your score. Yeah. It's what it's, it's what it's all about. And then someone comes along and wipes all your high scores off on the first day. It happens. It <laughs> happens. Um, believe, believe it or not. Um, just in terms of the uh, the tournament, so just, just so I'm clear on this. Okay. So um, I, I'm talking, I'm making this an open thing, but I'm hoping it'll answer anyone else's questions that's thinking of doing so. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's like David and Claire have started putting on tournaments and whatnot, if, if yeah. you are looking to do that. I mean, so if I wanted it ratified and I wanted to do it, what, what would I do if I wanted to run a tournament? I'd obviously contact you and say, Wayne, I'm looking to run a tournament. What do I then I, do? Well, you don't have to. No, <laughs> but it, it, it'd be, no, but I'd be saying, silly if Mary and I got, yeah. you know, got you here. Realistically, I mean, you mentioned Claire and David. Um, David was at Electric Circus, I think, and he saw my spreadsheet that I was doing the scores off running the competition. Um, and he asked if he could have a look at it. So I emailed it across to him because he wanted to put on his first league tournament. Sure. Um, so I sent it across, showed him how to modify it to, to suit his needs. And basically suggested that what the best format he could get for the number of machines he's got, the number of people he expects, also the level. Because if if you've got a really, really good player playing against a complete and utter newbie head to head, and they put up 150 million on Monster Bash first ball, yeah, and the other player drains and it's gone. It's no fun for them, really. Whereas, so in that kind of scenario, I would suggest a league format. You play with your mates or someone who's close to you. You play your game, you move on. You're not looking at everyone else's score and everyone's playing the same number of games. I've, I've literally got, how sad is this? I've got a memory key with about 15 different tournament formats, which I've invented all spreadsheets, I enter the score and it all follows through. Um, some of them are great and have been put into practice and have worked. Others, I've actually held a tournament and it's just been, no, nah, that's a bit crap actually. <laughs> we won't do that one again. I mean, I changed the scoring. So for a league meet, it was add all the scores up, find the average. If you got the average score, you got 100 points. If you got double the average, you got 200. And if you got half, you got 50. So there's a percentage based on. And all that needed was one one good game to actually blow up. And it put everything out of sync. So, But if you don't try these things and have a bit of a laugh and joke, there's another one which someone suggested about a handicap system. So I'm currently trying to work a way through that. I mean, personally, if the handicap system works the way it should, everyone has got exactly the same chance of winning on the day. Therefore, what's the point? You may as well just roll the dice. It's oh, partly my thinking. That's that's the way horse racing works. If the if the yes. people who set the handicaps get the handicaps right, it's a very close race. If they get the handicap wrong which could be because that horse is being held back in previous races, so they get a favourable weight, and then they romp it in the 
so yeah so it's something i'm, I'm playing with and and having a look at that's, that's, uh, it's I not going to be worth it's not going to be worth any ranking points but that's not the point it's get it on and have a have a bit of a laugh it's basically it was again it was phil dixon who came up with the with the idea and he was comparing he was basically comparing me him and let's just say another player so and we're ranked in that order so the first the middle player whatever they score they score Whatever I score, I get 10% taken off my score. Sure. And whatever the worst player scores, he gets 10% added on. So I'm just trying to figure out how I can make that work with 20 people. What about, because um, yeah, listen, you, you've clearly given this so much thought. You've got 15 different tournament concepts, but you like your football as well. Um, is this I did, just... I've, already, I've already done one exactly on the World Cup format. Literally, at the start of the day, everyone turns up, they get randomly allocated a team, and we had a group of four. So we had Ghana, Croatia, England, and Spain. And you played each of the other people, and then you went through to the knockouts and semi-finals. The only problem with that format, although everyone understood it and it was really good fun, you could get knocked out after three games. Good. And then, and then you've got... Yeah, but if you're going to travel... If you're I've going got... to travel halfway around the country... Yeah, but not the only not the only tournament. Something like that, yeah. you know, in a day of stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking selfishly, Wayne. I'm thinking about yeah. my really good game that I had to scrap. I'm thinking <laughs> this, on the right day when you're bagging form, almost like the FA Cup where you can just... I guess it's yeah. match play, is it? It's just causing. Well, we've had money. we've had we've had high school. Well, that's the difference. You haven't been to Swavesley, have you? No. Because we do the pinball cup, which is in memory of Nigel Hill, I believe, who's before my time, um, which Martin runs, and that is literally like the FA Cup. Sure. So, so it's on a Sunday afternoon. You could play. The first game, lose, well, there you go, I'm out. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but it's such a social weekend that the competition takes a backseat. The highlight, the highlight of the weekend is the Friday and Saturday, sat in the beer garden drinking. Um, and then Sunday, it's the raffle because you'll have been pestered all weekend by Gary Flower to donate for the raffle, which is all for charity. People bring stuff along. And the same prizes turn up year from year. So you win your ticket. There's there's not a great deal left, but you've got to take something. So you take um, an old Bally schematic manual and you go, oh, great, I've won something. Next year, there's your donation to the raffle prize. Thank you very much. Um, and the same prizes go round and round and round. Yeah, you're thinking, oh, I, I won this bottle of fruit <laughs> after shave 10 years ago. Yeah. So, and then the, the only other highlight is the raffle. The raffle is near the end of the day, but the competition doesn't start until five, ten laps into the Grand Prix because it always falls on a Grand Prix day. So everyone goes into the bar, starts the Grand Prix, and then it's right, okay, we'll best play some pinball, I suppose. But it's also fun because unlike the larger shows where you've got people having to hire vans, there's literally 15 people take one machine each. So you can stick that in the back of your car. You don't have to worry about hiring vans. There's not the same pressure to... Because one of the hardest things about taking half a dozen a dozen machines to a show it isn't so much the taking them there it's not even the bringing them back it's setting them all up after you've got them home there's machines which have turned up to pinfest which i know have been tombstoned the whole year since the last time they came back because they just couldn't be bothered setting them back up sure so um, actually, nice segue into Pinfest, actually, which is uh, we'll we'll finish on that. So 
this wonderful tournament, which was my first um, first insight into it, really. I, I was amazed by it all um, to the point where on the final day, I didn't actually play a pinball machine aside from, you know, the a, competition. Yeah. And then watching it on the screen. I don't think I'd be watching the screen, but there I was watching the screen and watching it there and then walking. Well, granted, I was doing a little bit of film as well, but I was, ge- even if I hadn't have been, I was genuinely interested in watching the drama and watching everyone sort of sitting down and getting up. And I could see some <laughs> people were really nervous. Um, I thought that was fascinating watching how different people sort of handle nerves and in front of the crowd and things like that. Um, oh, just fascinating. But it was really slick. It was really good. And actually from a sort of sporting environment, uh, just to have when it got really near the end, I don't know, it must have been 30, 40, 50 people all sort of stood around with a little cordoned off area. Fantastic, Wayne. Fantastic. Oh, sorry. It's all right. I unplugged the battery by mistake. Um, before I started. Yeah, that... See, because that kind of tournament where the qualifying is unlimited entries was unheard of in this country because it was perceived as pay to win. If you buy enough entries, you'll finish top. Oh, you don't. (laughs) Um, So, again, like Flip Frenzy, where I was the first one to introduce that in this country, I was the first one to introduce that at a show. And I did it at Manchester, I don't know whether it was Manchester or Blackpool, one of the Play Expo shows. Um, and it got positive reviews. So I thought, right, okay. And then when Phil asked me to run the competition at Pinfest, I said, right, we're going to give this a go. Um, and you can look back on the threads on Pinball Info. It was, oh, well, I won't be entering. It's crap and it's pay to play and blah, blah, blah. It's only... It, it was the same argument, funnily enough, as the pound yeah. IFPA fee. It's, oh, well, why am I paying just to pad out the first prize? Because it it's just alien to the UK player base. In America, it's, well, that's what it is. Um, so it, it ran well. The qualifying, I mean, if ever there was an example that you can't pay to get your way into the top, was there was one individual who shall remain nameless. Um, and I think he spent 200 odd pounds, five pounds an entry, he had 40 entries, and didn't get anywhere near. Whereas there were, there were half a dozen of us who qualified on every single ticket they played because it was four for 20 pounds and still is. Um, so it gives people it gives people the opportunity to play as much as they want or as little as they want. They don't have to a lot of the other formats you need to dedicate your whole day to the competition. And the thing with Pinfest is it's a show with a competition yes. running alongside. It's not like one of not like one of the events at Neil's house, for example, or the UK Open and all the associated tournaments that which are tournaments. If you're going there to to play social pinball, you're gonna be disappointed. That's not what it's about. Sure. There's a lot of socializing as soon as you're knocked out. Um but it is a tournament focused yeah. thing. Whereas Pinfest tries to be a bit of a bit of both a decent tournament that the top players can get interested in and it's been over 500 pounds prize money the the last few times which was the highest um but i think the uk open is going to blow that out the water with a five thousand pound first prize is it five thousand pound first prize he's neil's got sponsorship from all and sundry so he's he put up a couple of days ago that it's five thousand pounds guaranteed first prize. Wow. And that's just one competition. And with that kind the thing bringing it right back to the start, 
the thing with that kind of money and also having four events on and them being of a long enough length and structure and format that they're worth massive amounts of points, it then attracts the top European, European players who think or well, certainly are capable of winning. So they're chasing the money, but they're also chasing the ranking points. But top players don't chase ranking points. So yeah. what, what do I know? Well, um, it's, it, the ranking points, obviously, it's not like the European Tour in terms of golf, whereby, you know, the top ranking player is going to win a pot at the end. The ranking points surely just only sort of assist you in terms of in, in tournament play and whatnot. The, the prizes and the prize money and the glory of the trophies still are surely by winning a tournament. So I mean, you gave the example of the thing in New York where they were by all accounts, you didn't use these words, but I will, massaging the figures uh, by getting these punters in off the streets to make it look like it was a popular tournament when it wasn't, surely that all falls down because what you're doing is you're falsely elevating yourself into a position where your ranking points suggest you're a brilliant player. And then you're going to go to a tournament, you might be crap. Yeah, there's a... Um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of people... My, who, my words, my words. Yeah. No, no, I, I'm just being careful of what I'm about to say. <laughs> There's a number of people who post high school, or in the past have posted high scores on pinball info or on pin side, and you think, oh, they must be a really good player. And then when you play them, you think, you never got that score. <laughs> not with not with a glass on. And are you kidding? What What's the point? So... No, but this, this is it. You'll, you'll get you'll get found out, won't you? When, when you when you play uh, in a tournament, uh, why? Listen, mate, fascinating talking to you. You're going to um, well, uh, firstly, good luck with the new role. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, a bit of a glutton for punishment, but I think it'd be rewarding as well. You know, I think yeah, um, it's, it's it's. I guess my enjoyment, satisfaction of knowing that I'm introducing more people to play pinball and um, the uk leagues another prime example that's unlikely to be worth ranking points next year um and i've got a couple of things a couple of little tweaks i can possibly make to to make it more enticing but still keep the family social friendly elements to it as well but some of the coordinators and top tournament directors will be at swayze so we can all have a chat over a few beers and come up with completely another gobbledygook, no doubt. Well, you know what, mate? Honestly, you do an awful lot for the UK pinball scene. I'm certainly very grateful to you. I know, you know a lot of people. Yeah, I know you. You, you live and breathe pinball, and it's evident. Just you lose it, mate. Yeah. Comes comes <laughs> across really. But I tell you, no, seriously, you know, you've got a nice balance mm. as well because you you are competitive. But I've, I've seen you at like the non-competitive things, and you know you are great. You do try and help a lot of people out. You're always happy to explain rules and and. You know, and uh, so yeah. you know, after I've played my game, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was a you. I was a you. I'll explain, yeah. I'll explain yeah. the rules. This running. is how I beat you, yeah. It's very kind of you. Um, you're gonna do a video for us at Pinfest, aren't you? You're gonna show us do a tutorial on a machine of some description, yeah. I'll, you, that if, might if need a can... few more, that might need a few more edits than this, I'm guessing. I don't know. I don't know. It'd, you know, it'd be nice to do to do something. I'm, yeah. you know, mindful of, of my own um limitations, so I do. I would like to, within a year or two, have a number of videos on this channel of good players playing a machine that they like to actually talk us through the rules live. And, you know, uh, that's yeah. something I really want to do. So appreciate that, mate, certainly. Um, Wayne, thank you for any final words, my friend, before you leave. All I would say is the official announcement from the IFPA is the 1st of July, and I'm sure they will have FAQs on the website. So before you throw all your anger and ire at me, go and have a look what's on there on the 1st of July. And if you want to have a chat in person, I'm at Swavesy, and it'll only cost you a beer or a question. And I will then open up a thread on Pinball Info after that so people can ask questions in a polite and civilised way. 
Absolutely. And it is worth pointing out that 10% of the price of that beer will be going uh, to, <laughs> to America. I don't I tell you what, in case anyone what, takes it too seriously. What he could do, and this is an, and I'm sure you'll be thrilled, an open invitation to Josh to get in touch with either myself or you, and potentially he could come on and I'll do a trimmag with you in I'd the future. I'd love that. I'd love that. Because I'm sure he's got lots more interesting stories than me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be very, very welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Tap, tap him up, if that's what you call it. In, yeah, I was going to say, way. keep, just keep this in the, in what you put out. And it's there in the public domain then, isn't it? Mate, uh, mate. Uh, <laughs> apart from a little bit on 19 minutes, which I've already written down when yes. I wasn't, we weren't quite sure. Apart from that, mate, this will be a, a full edit. Nothing, nothing controversial with 19 minutes. We just didn't know when the date this was going out. Yeah. Um, Wayne. Really appreciate it, mate. Thank you so Brilliant. much. I look forward to seeing you soon. Cheers, buddy. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay, mate. Cheers. Cheers.